thing I look forward to most and the thing I enjoy most about touring Europe is food. I like eating, man. I think it's great. The new record, Lightwork, is, I mean, it was written at the latter half of the pandemic and recorded during that period as well. And it was such a negative time that I consciously tried to make music that was more positive. So I've used Framus guitars now for probably about a decade, I guess. My, my dad had a Framus banjo when I was a kid. So like the first instrument that I ever played, I think was probably a, <laughs> a Framus. I love the attention to detail that Framus puts into their instruments. And I think the thing that I like about them is as pretty as they are, I can beat the shit out of them. Or some of the behaviors that I had exhibited were interpreted as being more indicative of mental illness rather than poor behavior on my part. And there's going to be certain people in your life that will never unsee you as being that person. Hey everybody, this is Devin Townsend. I'm currently on tour in Europe. We're in Leipzig, Germany, and I'm going to do an interview now for you. My music has evolved and changed over the years, and the new record, I think um, the intent which I have for writing music remains the same. That's always been the same. And I think that just every year that goes by, you're presented with a new group of of experiences that elicit a different emotional response. So I would say that although the music changes according to whatever stimulus you're presented with, the intent is the same as it's been since the beginning. So the new record light work is, I mean, it was written at the latter half of the pandemic and recorded during that period as well. And it was such a negative time that I consciously tried to make music that was more positive based on the fact that the amount of effort it takes for me to create records requires me sitting and listening to it a lot. So with that in mind, I didn't want to surround myself and compound that that negativity with more negativity. So I consciously made something that was more productive. Yeah, my current tour takes me throughout Europe, and I've toured here many times. Um, and there's been many memorable experiences, of course. I mean, 30 years of doing this uh, <laughs> has resulted in a lot of experiences. Um, in terms of specific experiences, I mean, there's some shows, of course, that were really um, impactful to me, like we did with the orchestra in Bulgaria, and we've played... Uh, the Royal Albert Hall in London several times, and I've had the good fortune to um, headline some festivals throughout Europe. And the thing I look forward to most and the thing I enjoy most about touring Europe is food. It doesn't have to be anything in specific. I just, I like, I like going places and eating things. And uh, um, yeah, I had good food last night. And I will probably have good food today. I like eating, man. I think it's great. I've had beautiful food in Germany. Um, I've had awful food in Germany too, but I could say that with every country. It's not even the type of food. It's just, it's a comfort that amidst the intensity of touring, I value, right? I think uh, so much of my life when I'm on tour becomes under a microscope, I, I end up doing interviews and people are looking at me and things like this. And, and, you know, it's part of the job and I'm okay with it for sure, but I don't seek it out. And so when I'm at home, I'm very insular. And as such, I don't get a chance to eat a lot of good stuff. So when I go on tour, I figure if you're going to be seen as much as being on tour, um, makes it appropriate for me to be saying I might as well eat as well. So <laughs> I've been open about certain struggles that I've had in terms of my psychology over the years, uh, mental health. And I hope that by uh, being open about it and by also learning from mistakes that I may have made in the past that 
put me in a position where some of the behaviors that I had exhibited were um, interpreted as being more indicative of mental illness rather than poor behavior on my part. And I guess the hope that I have for moving forward and doing the work that I do is that learning to fail efficiently is a huge part of success. So I think that what's what typically can happen is if people have made a mistake or if they've done something that was embarrassing or they've done something that um, they found humiliating, the tendency is often to just um, stop and like give up in a way, right? But for me, I went through a bunch of things when I was younger, um, be it with drugs or with uh, alcohol or, or just arrogance on my part that allowed me to exhibit behaviors that, that were inappropriate publicly. And um, my hope is that by showing people the process that I employ on a, on a musical level, that has yielded a lot of growth throughout the years, then maybe they will see their own potential misgivings as being something that's not like a final um, definition of who they are. I think that um, I think that for me, I had been diagnosed when I was younger as um, as a number of things, but it was really just because I was, I was just messed up. And, uh, when it finally came around that that was more what the truth was, it was, uh, embarrassing to say the least to have to come out and say, listen, this is where I was at. And there's going to be certain people in your life that will never unsee you as being that person. And I think that for me, a lot of the growth has come from accepting the fact that you can only show growth by your actions as opposed to your words. So if you expect people to um, just believe that your your ways have changed over the years without going through the effort of learning from your, your mistakes and then acting in accordance to how you feel these lessons should manifest then uh, it's all pillow talk. And I like to think that the nature of my work, even going back to your first question, is ultimately rooted in self-discovery. And so the, the process of making those mistakes and continuing to make mistakes, of course, uh, is a fundamental part of the process. And... Um, I think that's, if you've chosen, which I have, to, to make art based on that as your foundation, man, it's like, you just have to suck it up. Yeah. So I've used Framus guitars now for um, probably about a decade, I guess. Then my first interaction with Framus instruments was my my dad had a Framus banjo when I was a kid so like the first instrument that I ever played I think was probably a, a Framus as a side note I was working with some other com companies and uh, what tends to happen with my work is I, I focus specific sounds on specific instruments and I always had this idea for like a Les Paul custom style sound because I love that for the heavy stuff, but I couldn't, I just, I, I just always felt like I looked really ridiculous playing a Les Paul, even though I liked the sound. And I wanted to try and get something that was really like a work of art in a sense. Um, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to work with companies and, and I have a lot of guitars and things like that, but I love the attention to detail that Framus puts into um, their instruments and to have sort of this un, 
limited palette of options that allows me to make things that it's almost like when I make a record, the art and the guitar and everything is kind of part of it. And in the past I would work with guitar companies and I'd say, okay, well the aesthetic of this record is whatever it is. And, and it would be amazing if we could illustrate that with an instrument that I could use as my primary tool. And they'd be like, well, you can do it, but, but, you know, we have to compromise here and we have to compromise here. <laughs> but with Framus, they were just like, oh yeah, we can do that. Oh, and we'll put a fog machine in it and we'll put a smoke machine and we'll put a laser in it. And, and I just love that, uh, unlimited ability to kind of be, uh, you know, um, creatively free with the instruments. So I contacted <coughs> Framus, I guess, in right before the album. I forget which one it would have been. Maybe it was Epicloud or something. And I asked him about making like a sort of a really updated, modern, heavy metal guitar that looked like like a classic instrument, you know, like the AK stuff to put like heavy metal pickups and like the Evertune and everything. It's something that looked really like elegant. And when they did that and I got the guitar, I remember thinking, oh, this is, this is awesome for me, man. It's awesome for me. And it's, uh, I work, I mean, I have a ton of different guitars and I only use the ones that I love. So if I didn't love it, I would, I just, I, not even that I wouldn't use it, but I feel like I couldn't use it in a sense. So when you see me playing these guitars, it's it's because I love them. That's really what it is. And the and the sort of unlimited level of detail that they're willing to go so that every record cycle they make me a guitar that's like this was the empath one. This is the one for empath, right? And basically the whole idea with the color scheme and the lights and and everything about this was based on the artwork of empath and they're building me a new guitar now for they wanted to build something for the light work record but i couldn't figure out what it looked like and so they had said well we could do this we could do this and i said well i don't want you to spend money on it if it's if i don't really have a solid idea because then i won't use it you know what i mean like i only want to ask framus to help me with an instrument when i know that it's right so now they're building me this kind of universe guitar that's like it's the same body shape. We designed this together, Marcus and I. But the new one has kind of got like an epoxy river, and it's like it looks like a, something from a Hubble space uh, photo. And I just, for me, I love being able to do that, man. That's like a huge thing for me to have a company that's willing to illustrate my creative process each time I have a new creative idea with an instrument that becomes like synonymous with that period of my work in a way. We did one for the Ziltoid record that was a big flying V and it was crazy, you know? And then we did, um, as we were working towards the relationship that we now have, my association with them is that they make the guitar that defines each album cycle for me, right? And I'm looking forward to what they've got going right now. And as an instrument, they're, I mean, they're amazing. They're not, they're not just window dressing. They're really amazing instruments. They sound killer. They play amazingly. And I think the thing that I like about them is as pretty as they are, um, I can beat the shit out of them. And that's like a huge thing for me. I, I, I don't do well with fragile equipment. So although I've had this guitar for years and I've taken it around the world multiple times, it's like, it's still solid and it's like one little scrape there i think but it's not like it hasn't been scraped it's been dropped and like i i really use things heavily and i love that about it too if it was just a piece of art that was fragile i'd have no use for it right so yeah i i, I play six string mostly every now and then i use seven string but it never became like an integral part of my style it's more of an effect. So I use, uh, Framus built a seven string for me that I use on the uh, first two songs of the set that um, is basically because I've got a couple of chords that I really 
part of the part of the writing was that and so i use it for that effect right well people are under the assumption that i experiment with a lot of different tunings and string gauges but the truth of it is i usually stay in open c tuning and i have been in that since um I, since i began really it um when i was a child i was really infatuated by um the album led zeppelin 3 where he had used an open C tuning, which was C, G, C, G, C, E. And since that point, because I loved that song Friends so much as a kid, um, all my guitars were in open C. Sometimes I'll move to open B, yeah, rarely open B flat, but it's usually like we're doing 15 songs on this tour and it's all open C. Every now and then I'll use standard, but um, it only again for an effect right uh but in terms of string gauge no matter what the tuning whether it's standard open c open b drop d whatever i always use the same strings it's just uh 10 through 52 to dario and what's interesting about that is the tension obviously is much tighter with 10 through 52 in standard as it is 10 through 52 in open c but in my mind, I relate to the feeling of standard that way and the feeling of C this way and the feeling of B a little more loose because it's always the same string gauge, right? Oh, and also the Stormbender, we experimented at first with 24 and three quarter scale, uh, which was much like the Les Paul Custom because even though it looks like it's a neck through or feels like a neck through, it's a set neck. But because of my propensity for open C, it's a 25 inch scale, right? And so it's it's a little little tighter than it than it may be if I use this tuning on a Les Paul. So how learning guitar was back when I was a kid, um, 800 years ago, um, without internet. The way that I figured out the open C tuning from that Led Zeppelin song is I think I just did it by ear. I don't remember a specific moment, oddly enough, but I believe that in that tuning, you can hear that low note. Yes. And so I just kind of pieced it together. And then I guess I just um, turned the tuning pegs until it seemed easiest. And then by the time I had done that, I think it was open C. So it just kind of found its way into my world more so than then a moment maybe though because they had those guitar magazines back then too that maybe that was it but i don't remember a specific moment where 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 i i dropped it into open c it was either i did it by ear or it was a article in a guitar magazine talking about jimmy page well in a sense it's it's less exotic because it's it's a major chord which is one finger and it's it's interesting because when you strum a standard guitar to see open strings it doesn't necessarily to me at least sound like music right it's just a collision of, of tones but with this it's like straight out of the gate it's a chord and so kids can play it or whatever and i think maybe one of the reasons why i gravitated to it so much is as a singer it's easier too i don't have to do the bar chords necessarily i can just kind of hammer away on like single note kind of things right and it just probably in the beginning i i was still in standard to a certain degree but i i just ended up migrating towards this over time because i just i mean i just really it sounds silly but it was always just like oh yeah that's where i should be that's the tuning i should be in right my relationship with Framus has changed the way that I do things to a degree because I know that as I'm working, if there's something that's problematic about it, I can ask for it to be modified in the next iteration of, of you know, its lineage. So this one is different than the first two that we did because we cut this just a touch. We thinned the neck just a touch. We made the body a little more chambered, you know. Um, and those are the types of things that have changed the way that I write with it because as I'm writing, I think to myself, oh, it would be cool if we did it this way next time or if it if this was just a little more 
one way or another. <clears throat> but what's really important for me to say about the Frana stuff is endorsements are really weird, man. You know, it's like they're super weird. I use what I use because it works great for me. Like that's it. There's no, there's no ulterior motive. It's like, it's not like we're, you know, it's, there's no backroom dealings or anything. They make guitars for me, which is awesome. But I wouldn't play them if I didn't think they were awesome. Like really, I do, uh, you know, I also do, a, I use a headless Kiesel guitar as well, but I talked to Framus about that. I was like, you don't make a headless guitar. I really like that guitar. Can I use that? And they said, yes. So the reason I use that is because I like that. And the reason I use this is because I like this. And it's, I got offered guitars from a ton of other companies and I just didn't like them as much, you know? So, um, and plus I really like the people there too, like Hans and his family and Marcus and everybody there. They've been really, not just kind to me, but just as people, like they've been logical with me. So when I want to try something else or if I want to, you know, I've, I've got an acoustic guitar with, with Prestige in Vancouver. You know, it's a Vancouver company and it made sense for me. And, and I work the headless thing for my ambient work with Kiesel and both of those things I talked to Framus and I said, that really would mean a lot to me to be able to do that because I would hate to have to say publicly like oh remember how much i said this was an awesome guitar and now i'm selling something else i mean it just looks so stupid but i have different needs and different um utilizations for these tools and this one i made specifically for the music i write and so i don't need anything else other than this one right it's it's really a it's really a fantastic tool for me and i love the fact that they're just like this unbelievable thing, you know, it's amazing, man. Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> apparently I've been in the prog, prog scene for a while now, but I never, I don't remember when that happened. Um, cause before that I was in metal scene and I don't even know, man, I don't, I don't care. I feel that for me, I just want to do whatever I want to do and, and with good people and with, um, honest people and with, um, uh, people who are willing to, uh, grow. And so in my estimation, the prog scene has kind of grown in the sense that it seems more likely to accommodate that mindset. I think like any scene, things get tied to the familiar tropes. And when I was younger, Prague was always very, like, a specific thing. It was, like, uh, Yes and Genesis and, um, you know, and then in the 90s, I guess, it was more like Dream Theater and, and, and I think all those bands are, are incredibly talented, but there was never really my, it's not where I came from necessarily. I mean, to a degree, yes, I guess, but only in their 80s stuff. But before, I was much more, I was much more into, like, you know, Motorhead or, or, um, um, Judas Priest or Jane's Addiction or, uh, Leonard Bernstein, the, the musical theater stuff, or I loved, uh, soundtracks and Stravinsky and, um, and I really liked ambient music and, and really beautiful music. Like I always loved Enya and, um, I loved Def Leppard when I was a kid because the production was so awesome. But I also loved the grindcore stuff. I loved all the Napalm Death, uh, you know, Pitch Shifter, Old Lady Drivers stuff and the electronic stuff I loved and the industrial stuff I loved. And so maybe the definition of prog for me at this point is just the willingness of an audience to accept all those things in one place. And... I think that's the ways that the prog scene has changed is because up till relatively recently, uh, I don't think that would have been as accepted. I think you had to stick with certain things in order to be accepted in that genre. It's like anything, right? Like metal genre, what is true metal or, or whatever. Um, 
I'm fortunate that I'm pig-headed and I'm fortunate that I don't care. So it's like it's allowed me to progress. And then after 30 years, I've just been doing it pig-headedly for so long that people are like, oh, I guess he's he's still here. Then here I am. <laughs> Have I ever found myself getting lost in my own philosophical musings? And if so, how do I snap myself out of it? Yes, of course. Uh, how do I snap myself out of it? Uh, meditation. That's the only thing that's... That's the only thing, really. Everything else is artifice. You know, I think that... I think that philosophical musings, particular in the past for me, it was uh, like a bad habit. It's like... I think one of the biggest addictions is overthinking and it's often um it's like it's a good defense mechanism when you're when you're afraid right and I think for years I've I've defaulted to that when I found things to be too real or too um too indicative of of like an actual truth so you can sort of philosophize your way around it to make yourself feel more in control but I think that the only solution and not just for that but just in general is to sit and shut up and then with a certain amount of practice with that I, I, I find that a lot of that stuff goes away and so the philosophical aspects that I have had in my work over the years in the same way as prior mistakes I may have made on a personal level is much more just like that's just where I was. You know what I mean? It's not good or bad. It's just that's where I was. All I want to do is write. That's all I want to do. And touring is a means to an end. It promotes the brand. And it helps me promote the brands that help me promote the brand and give me the tools to do the things that I want. All I want to do is write. And uh, if what it takes for me to be able to hide away and make music is to get out here and sing for people... I mean, that helps me on a number of levels as well, like creatively, uh, emotionally, to be thrust into a scenario that you're uncomfortable with ultimately yields good things for me, so I'm down with it. But man, let's get back to the studio. Thank you very much.